Welcome to Mohobe Nuggets of Wisdom podcast. My name is Mumpulu Kiluruma Mohobe. Our objective is to enthuse, inspire, energize, and empower entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs of all stripes here in BW and beyond. We do so by inviting these entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs into our makeshift studio. Sometimes we call them to the restaurant, sometimes we go uh, to our studio and we ask them to share their experiential knowledge, their experiences and their expertise. And we ask them uh, as many questions as we can aimed at empowering you also as a viewer. Hello dear viewer, dear listener, my name is Mumpulu Kiluruma Mokhobe, uh, your host of this exciting and wonderful show, Mokhobe Nuggets of Wisdom podcast. As always, I bring you exciting and challenging, you know, uh, guests, and I'm delighted to welcome to the studio Mr. Letrohonolo Moremi, who is an intellectual property consultant. Today we're going to talk about the intersection of intellectual property and development. We're going to talk about all things intellectual property. Uh, Mr. Moremi, I would really like for you to introduce yourself, tell the viewer who you are and a little bit of your background. Right. Um, my name is Lutoko Nolo Moremi. Mm -hmm. I am an intellectual property consultant, as you have mentioned. Mm -hmm. um, I am the founder of um, Park Grey IP, which is a an intellectual property consultancy um, based in Botswana. Mm -hmm. And I'm also a practicing creative development practitioner. Um, I work with a friend of mine on a company called MG Art and Creative Development. I also work with uh, another friend on a company called DM Creative Brands, where we do brand management and PR. Okay, right. tell me about Park Grey IP. What is that about? Uh, Park Grey IP is an intellectual property and entertainment law consultancy. Uh, what we basically do is, um, it was born from the foundation of uh, trying to help Botswana or help the African continent generally uh, move towards an economy where uh, the young people on the continent can be able to create, to be the source of change or to be the source of economic change. Because I always talk about how uh, the African continent has the youngest population by age. Um, the, young, the African continent has the biggest demographic of young innovators. And there is no reason why those young minds, those young innovators cannot be a catalyst towards providing solutions for challenges now and in the future. When you talk about innovation, that's it's a buzzword right now. Right. So I think a good starting point in that context is to define what mm -hmm. intellectual property means and right. what it is right. and what it means to innovators. Right. Um, intellectual property is firstly a class of property. So it's something that can be owned. It's something that can be traded, sold and as such. Uh, but it's a class of property that refers to intangible assets that are the result of um, the application of creativity of the mind. Um, I think most commonly when we talk about things like music, when we talk about things like art, those are the, most, the more readily understood forms of intellectual property. But it goes beyond that. It goes into areas of uh, brands. Um, a brand can be a piece of intellectual property. It goes into areas of technology and finance where methods of doing business, formula of doing business, um, technical products such as, you know, the, the iPhones that we use today, those can be pieces of intellectual property. Um, so that's what we mean when we say intellectual property. It's what the mind has created. Okay. Um, I'm glad that I'm talking to a colleague. You're a lawyer like me. I see. Um, but what I'm curious about is how, why, why did you decide to specialize and focus right. on, on intellectual property? Right. There could be any other field that you could be focused on if it, you wanted. It, absolutely, it could have been. Yeah. Uh, but I think for me, it, it was a confluence of many factors. Mm. Uh, firstly, I individually am a person who has always been creative in one way or another. Whether it's in science class doing experiments, um, trying to, I, I remember I was 10 years old trying to build a robot by taking my toys apart and putting them back together. Oh. It didn't work out too well. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I, also in terms of the arts, I've been a writer myself, I've been a poet. So creativity in every aspect of life has always been very important to me. Um, and then the course of advocacy as well, which set a very clear path for me to be a law student, to study law. Mm. Um, 
And then it became a merger of these two things where it's this creative individual who has a passion for this area of commerce, which is the law. And it was a sensible meeting point for me. But again, another factor was how best can I serve my community? How best can I serve my continent? And I believe that by empowering young people, entrepreneurs and innovators to be in a position where their ideas and their products can produce economic value and sustainable economic value at that. If I can contribute to that, I think there is a change that I will be making in my own country and in the continent. That's wonderful. Um, let's talk about the Botswana Intellectual Property Framework. Right. What pieces of legislation are in place mm -hmm. and how does it really work, practically speaking? Right. Um, the, there are two primary pieces of legislation that regulate intellectual property. Um, and these are the Copyright and Neighboring Rights Act and the Industrial Property Act. Um, the Copyright and Neighboring Rights Act deals with artistic and literary works. Mm. Uh, so those would be the music, the paintings, the art, the books, the writings. Um, so it deals with an area of law known as copyright, which applies to those things. And then the Industrial Property Act deals with, well, industrial property in the sense that the, it's a type of intellectual property whose main focus is commercial application. So these will be your trademarks, this will be your patents. And an interesting thing also is that it provides for uh, protection for uh, traditional and indigenous knowledge. Um, so again, it goes back to... Even medicines. Even medicines can mm. be put, even traditional medicines, mm -hmm. interestingly enough. Yeah. Uh, so those are things that um, can have some, so, some aspect of commercial application and therefore um, are protected in the business sense um, as business assets and as you know, things in the area of commerce. What did you say are the key provisions on those pieces of legislation? Right. The key centerpiece uh, clauses, right. if you like, or, right. or sections. Right. Um, without mentioning any in particular, but I think with the Industrial Property Act, the, need, the provisions that deal with registration, because for you to protect a piece of industrial property and for it to be afforded um, that protection, whether it's a trademark, whether it's a patent, it has to be registered as such. If it's not registered as such, um, it does not necessarily receive that protection. Um, and therefore, so the one of the challenges that I find in my practice is people who find themselves with a very good, brilliant product, but they haven't com complied with the legal requirements for what this, uh, how this can be protected. It needs to be assessed for registration. It, it needs to pass the registrability test and then it needs to be registered. So if they haven't gone through those processes, you find that somebody could have had a patent for a very brilliant technical solution that would have benefited the country, but they did not take the right mm -hmm. steps to make sure that this is protected. And because they did not do that, then it, it, it the wastes. ideas can be quote unquote stolen, basically. Of course, of mm -hmm. course. That's another thing as well. Um, mm -hmm how do you protect other people from using what is your idea mm. um, so that the key provisions for me are knowing what um you know the the registration and the re registration requirements for each piece of intellectual property and then also when it comes to copyright knowing that um who belong what belongs to who I'm, a lot of people have questions about um if i hire maybe a, a, a photographer for example and I ask them to do this and they put a watermark on my picture. Doesn't the picture belong to me? Why is there a watermark there? And oftentimes I have to explain, well, ownership belongs to the creator, of course. Mm. Um, but if it's a commissioned work, ownership belongs to the person who commissioned it. But doesn't that doesn't take away the right of the creator to be credited for their work, mm. which may mean putting a watermark on their mm. work. Mm. Uh, so it's those little Does things. Does it matter whether or not you've paid? Not necessarily, mm. because the right to be acknowledged as the creator of work is, exists independently outside the scope of economic rights. Mm. Uh, so when it comes to copyrights, there are economic rights and there are moral rights. Mm. Economic rights deal with the right to reproduce, the right to, you know, to adapt, the right to sell. Mm. Um, but the moral rights deal with the right to say, I am the one who created this. Okay. And so you could pay me for my... IP, but if I say it, it has to be, it has to be known that it's mine. It has to be known okay. that it's mine. Yeah. 
Yeah. Now let's talk about the international framework. Obviously, there are conventions. Absolutely. Um, when one comes to mind, I think, is the Ben Convention on, on intellectual property. Absolutely. I do not know whether Botswana has acceded to all of them. Absolutely. Uh, can you give the viewer an idea as to the international framework? Right. It's one thing to have protection in Botswana. Right. But what are the implications internationally? internationally. Mm. Absolutely. Um, Botswana has um, acceded to the, the Berne Convention. There's also the Madrid Convention that deals with uh, patents, uh, uh, rather trademarks. And then there's the Patent Corporation Treaty, uh, which deals with uh, patents. And Botswana is a member of all of these uh, these international instruments. Botswana is also a member of the overarching body, which is the World Intellectual Property Organization. Uh, also a member of the African Regional uh, Intellectual Property Organization. So what that means is that if you, ex especially within the context of industrial property, so your patents and your trademarks, if you have a trademark, uh, you, can, you can be able to, to register a trademark here and in other jurisdictions that are members of um, that body. So if I perhaps register the shape of this glass as a trademark, mm. uh, then I can be able to have that applicable um, perhaps in in the na in neighboring South Africa, of course, these are very jurisdictional matters. But at the core of it is that I can be able to benefit from that protection here and in any other country that is a member of that treaty. Okay. Now we want to apply this to entrepreneurs. You know the importance of intellectual property to innovators and entrepreneurs, and even SMMEs. So for us to um, let me lay a groundwork for that 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 sort of discussion by asking. Um, what the process is like uh -huh. uh, for an entrepreneur. For instance, let's say I've invented this spoon, for argument's sake. Right. What are the protocols and procedures that I have to undergo uh -huh. and how long does it take? Absolutely. Um, so if we can answer that question and then see how it tailors into explaining about the framework for entrepreneurs. Right. Mm. Um, I think it, 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 it depends on what you have created. A lot of um, inquiries that I get, often somebody saying, um, I would like to patent my brand. And then you have to un explain that you can trademark a brand, but not patent it. Mm. So the first step is to know what it is that you have created mm. and what is the protection that is applicable to what you have created. Um, if you Then I maybe have to interrupt you that, that you define the difference. The copyright, a trademark, and right. what's the other one? A patent. A patent. Right. Maybe you need to just define those quickly Absolutely. before we move forward. Absolutely. So copyright would be protections that apply to artistic and literary works, as I've mentioned. Mm. Uh, so your books, your paintings, your music, your films, that sort of thing. Um, and then trademarks would apply to brands, logos, uh, slogans, anything that you can use to distinguish your business from the next person. So if the purpose of a trademark is to be able to say this uh, product, this business, this service belongs to X person. Does it even include the names of companies? It includes the names of companies. It includes the name, the, the, the slogan, brand. the mm. whatever. For example, you know, if you look at a certain bottle, there's a certain company that sells um, soda, um, mm. fizzy drinks. Mm. They have a certain bottle that looks a certain way that whenever you see it, you know it's their product. Mm. Something like that can be trademarked. Mm. Um, and then when you deal with patents, patents deal with more technical know-how and technical solutions. Mm -hmm. uh, so it would be your machines, it would be your processes of doing something or your processes of producing something largely applicable to medicines and things like that. Um, so then there are lesser protections under there which in can go uh, can include uh, industrial designs. Mm -hmm. uh, so industrial designs dealing more with um, the aesthetic of how something looks. Yeah. Uh, so if I designed this table and I want it, I've designed it in a special shape, in a special way, I could, I may not be able to patent that, but I may be able to have an industrial design registered for that. Mm. Um, and also utility models, which are, which deal with more the function of things, the, the, the functional aspect of things. Mm. Um, so then knowing what, what you have created and where it falls within that spectrum, then the next step would be to determine what steps are needed within that particular process, right? For for a trademark in Botswana, uh, what you do is, of course, you, you file an application with CIFA, you produce reproductions of the trademark, um, and the process could take anything from about five months to a year, I believe. How on tedious or user-friendly is the process? <laughs> <laughs> Depending on 
which point of view you take. <laughs> I think it, it depends also on what you are registering. I think things like trademarks are fairly easy to register, mm. uh, but things like patents are the process is very intensive. Um, so it it can take even up to three years because mm. there is so much information that you have to make available to the register to the registering authority. Uh, to, so that they can scrutinize and determine what exactly it is you have brought before mm. them and determine whether nobody else has done this before. Is this worth protecting in the same in, in oh. the way that you seek it protected? And that's important because what something like a patent does, it, it gives you monopoly mm -hmm. uh, for a certain period of time. So perhaps for 25 years, mm -hmm. you are the only person who can use this method or this formula to produce a certain result. So it's a process that needs to be intensely scrutinized. Mm. Um, so that, that can be a very tedious and very lengthy process. From the point of view of the consultant or the lawyer or from the point of view of the entrepreneur or all the entire team? I, I think from the point of the entrepreneur especially, uh, because they ordinarily would not expect something like that to take so long. Mm. Um, but for the point of those of us behind the scenes who know how these things work, we understand there's so much scrutiny that goes into it. So it's it's a lengthy process, but it's not a tedious process. Okay. But for a client, it may be a very tedious process. Okay. Let's talk about an intellectual property management strategy. Right. Is it something that is desirable for an entrepreneur? Mm -hmm. And if so, why? Absolutely. I think it is entirely imperative that entrepreneurs have intellectual management, the intellectual property management strategies, because entrepreneurs, especially in, the, in a context like Botswana, their intellectual property for most of them is the biggest asset that they have. For most of them, um, the brand that they have is the biggest asset that they have. Mm. The ideas that they are thinking that of producing is the biggest asset they have. A lot mm. of entrepreneurs don't have access to you know, resources such as capital or land, mm. which means their businesses are born from ideas and have to be sustained by profitability of ideas for a considerable period of time. Mm. Um, so then knowing how to manage what uh, what they produce in that process, knowing where to place value in what they produce in that process, knowing uh, this particular piece of intellectual property we can invest in, invest in its protection and maintenance, develop it so that it gains more value, and then we can be able to use the value yeah. that we get from it, the economic value mm -hmm. that we get from it to sustain the business for, for, um, for a, a, a certain period of time. I think the important point there is it goes down to economic value. It goes down to knowing that um, whether it's an idea, whether it's a process, whether it's a brand, whatever you're producing in that in that instance, knowing that you are producing it as an asset for the business. You need to know which assets to place priority on. You need to know which assets to let go when they are not being uh, mm. when they're not producing any more value or when. And my assumption is that you're able to render an opinion and actually give a. Right. Some kind of creative strategy for, for your clients. Absolutely. Have you been known to do that? Is that something you are absolutely your, your area of competence? Absolutely. That is something that we do at Parkway IP for clients because again, it's about helping them structure their portfolios to know what to let go, what to keep, what mm. to grow, mm. um, with a view of having a portfolio that um, generates economic value mm. again and doesn't cost you more than um, it gives you. Mm. Right. All right, let's move on and talk about the key points for trading and IP. Mm. Every, obviously, everybody is asking themselves, how do I monetize my IP? Right. How do I make it profitable for me? So what are the key considerations or key points you can share with the viewer? Right. Um, I think the first point for me is always understanding that what you have is property and ought to be treated as such. Mm. So... It may be a trademark, it may be a patent. It's a piece of property, which means it has economic value and you have to treat it as something that has economic value. Mm. Secondly, um, of course, there are you know, laws and regulations around um, you know, intellectual property and how it can be treated as, as such. But the biggest, con the biggest uh, consideration is this is always a contractual matter. Knowing where, what you're offering, knowing um, where you stand contractually is very, very important uh, because it all boils down to the agreement between you and the buyer. Thirdly, it's important to know the value of what you have. And there are ways of valuing different pieces of intellectual property. Um, there's 
in a transaction, are you selling at uh, what is known as fair price or are you selling at what is known as market price? Fair price being, uh, Mr. Mohobi says, um, you have a glass, I want to buy it for five kula. And I said, yeah. five kula is fair enough. So it's an agreement between the two of us. Yes. Right? Five kula, you, or you're offering five kula, I have five kula. Mm. It, it's, it's fine. Yeah, straightforward. That's fine. Mm -hmm. And then um, the market value being, okay, Mr. Mohobi says he wants to buy this glass for five kula, but when you look at the market, this glass goes for 10. Mm. So where then we know, are we establishing the value based on what you're offering and what I'm willing to take? Mm. Or are we establishing the value based on what other similar transactions look like? Mm. Um, and there are many other factors to consider as well. When you, especially when you're acquiring a piece of intellectual property, whether it's, a, I know a, there's a lot of people that are taking up franchises now, mm. uh, a lot of people that are taking licenses to use certain names, certain brands for business. Um, well, Black, for instance, is a franchise. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, where we are. Right. Mm. Absolutely. So the thing would, to consider then, there are other factors to consider, like um, what are known as uh, freedom to operate issues. Mm. Um, what challenges are you likely to run into uh, in terms of how much you can use this and or what you can do with it mm. um are there any possibilities of infringement mm. and if somebody does infringe on the ip is it going to cost you mm. how much is it going to cost you mm. um, so those considerations yeah uh, if i could interject there and and, and i've seen young entrepreneurs uh, when they're pitching ideas right um some of them will come with the nda non-disclosure agreement right some of them even go further and say nda non-circumvention agreement right. as well right to what extent do these sort of agreements protect right. the, the entrepreneur or the the young entrepreneur who's looking for funding right they are helpful but they, that also depends on other factors they are helpful as a starting point to be able because you know part of intellectual property is dealing with confidential information mm. um so when i come to you mr mahobe and i have a business proposal and it's it's essentially a piece of confidential information that i am making available to you yes um and for you to use that information for your own personal benefit, for your own economic benefit without my consent, would be an infringement on my rights, on my rights surrounding that piece of yeah. information. What those instruments do is they create a contractual agreement to abide by the rules of confidential information. Mm. Now, the challenge, where, the reason why I'm saying it depends on other factors is if Mr. Mohobe in fact goes ahead and breaches that agreement, mm. what am I able to do about it, mm. right? I am, able to, I am able to prove that yes, at this point in time, I made available said piece of information to him and he agreed to not do one, two, three, so he's in breach of contract. However, do I have the resources to pursue mm. a legal resolution, mm. right? So as which much which entails bringing an application to court and seeking an interdict. Absolutely, seeking mm. an interdict, or in other maybe seeking damages or whatever remedy you may seek. Mm. But it also takes the entrepreneur having resource to do that, or having access to a legal professional who can be able to implement, uh, sort of implement that mm. strategy for, for for him. Again, it's a. It's a good thing to have, and I always advise clients to have that. Mm. Um, but I also advise clients to not enter into it thinking it's a wall that nobody can jump over. Mm. Uh, you must be ready for the instance that somebody actually does get over the wall and mm. have your dogs. And ready. it is it's a two way street as well. I mean, Absolutely. once you've signed them, it might limit your ability to find an even better Absolutely. investor later on in the Absolutely. process. Okay. Absolutely. Um, Let's talk about IP and the creative economy. That's the direction we're taking. Everybody will tell you that we're moving from, um, you know, a normal economy. We're moving now into a gig economy. Right. So given this, uh, how would you advise entrepreneurs to adapt mm -hmm. and to innovate? Mm -hmm. And what skill sets do you bring to the table to assist the entrepreneur in that regard? Absolutely. Mm. Um, I think the, the genesis for me would be understanding that um, I know there's been a lot of talk around, you know, in this country uh, about moving to a knowledge based economy mm. um, and a creative economy is basically just just another way of, of saying that because mm. a creative economy is an economic framework that thrives on the production of production of innovation and solutions. Um, so it relies on intellectual labor, which means intellectual property is the biggest asset that is trading in that economy. Mm. Um, it's the ideas and the solutions that people come up with. Um, so then in, in that sort of understanding, 
it's for entrepreneurs to put themselves in a position where they are able to become economic players. Mm. Um, I'm putting it in that way because the challenge that we have is mm. solutions, innovations are not necessarily, people create them out of passion mostly, mm. but don't create them for an economic purpose. And that creates a challenge in building an economy around that mm. because there is not enough emphasis that is placed on business practice. There is not enough practice that is placed on learning the business uh, and treating the process as a business process, as opposed to a personal venture out of interest or, or, or the like. Mm. Um, and I think with our intellectual property practice, what we do is we are able to help entrepreneurs understand their entry point into this economy, mm. um, the value of what they're bringing into this economy, the things they need to look out for and the protections that are available for them in this economy and how to use how to take advantage of the existing frameworks uh, to be able to protect their interests as economic players in a, in a creative economy. Mm. I suppose this could be a, a good point to ask you about your curatorship of the uh, Johnny Walker and, and other. Right. Uh, to <laughs> yeah. Tell the viewer what that is all about, because it's a very interesting thing when I read your bio that right. I picked on. Yes. Mm. Uh, so with the company uh, DM Creative Brands, um, mm. what we do is brand management and PR that includes uh, uh, sort of building narratives around products for clients and uh, also positioning uh, a product, uh, positioning products for clients in the market. And um, the brands that you just mentioned, they were launching a new product in, in yeah. the country and they needed access to a new sort of buyer. Mm -hmm. And, you, and a, 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 the, the, you know, the usual buyer of uh, a whiskey would be you know, the older gent. Mm -hmm. you know? So they wanted access to a more younger, a uh, more vibrant market, mm. vibrant market. So basically, the people who are just acquiring buying power now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so we had to sort of okay, how do we curate a, an experience mm. for this sort of person that makes them under, that makes them you know take interest in your product? Mm. Uh, because if uh, I, I think young people in their early twenties are not necessarily that interested in whiskey. Mm. Um, so how do we take this product without changing the product itself? Mm. Mm. How do we create an experience around the product that yeah. makes them take interest in the product? You want to make it quote unquote sexy. We make it sexy sector. for them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We make it sexy for the young people. So we did that and it was it was a very fantastic experience. What did you do specifically to get it? Uh, what what did we do to get it? To get it, to get it uh, exciting for the young, the young viewer. Right. So what we did is we engaged with uh, influencers uh, in, and not influencers in the sense of people with social media followings, mm. but influencers as in people who the public looks to for an opinion on something. Mm -hmm. um, I think because there are different, you know, there are different type of influencers. There are people who you are influencers because they wear nice clothes on Instagram. Yeah, there are yeah. people who are influencers because they post very interesting information or they write very interesting articles. So anybody who holds a position of influence in one way or another can be an influencer. Mm, mm. So we curated a, a sort of a broad spectrum of people from different uh, points of authority, mm. uh, targeting different markets, of course, uh, engaging with people who are young entrepreneurs, engaging with people who are either in fashion, who are either in lifestyle, people who are in business, uh, but young people in that range who other people look to as authorities on mm -hmm. something. So when somebody that you trust, somebody whose opinion that you trust mm. is engaging with a certain product, you're more likely inclined to engage with that product mm -hmm. as well. The thing about changing a perspective like that is that um, they always say word of mouth mm. is the strongest recommendation. Uh, so if I can't, uh, ask uh, if I can't ask you to go around <laughs> telling everyone in the legal community that no buy whiskey. Yeah. What I will do is I will place you in a position where you are ha you have access to whiskey and you yeah. are enjoying that. And because they trust you and they trust your presence in that space, it creates interest. <laughs> in the, it's the second best. And thing. was there any did, was did that translate to sales? Did, were there any tangible results? Well, my part was not to, 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 to assess whether sales were there. Yeah. My part was to make sure that people know and people are talking about it yeah, and people yeah. are having an experience around it, which I think we achieved really yeah. well. Yeah, wonderful. Now, let's talk about traditional knowledge and cultural expressions. 
Um, could you share with the viewer how what your work assists in that area? Absolutely. Mm. Um, that for me is is a very interesting and fascinating aspect because I think, uh, like I mentioned earlier, the the Industrial Property Act allows for registration of traditional knowledge, indigenous knowledge, mm. um, and that is a is part of a bigger structure because at a at a more regional international level there's what is known as the Swakoman Protocol mm -hmm. uh, on internet on traditional knowledge and cultural expressions, which basically mandates. Yeah, so just concluded in Swakoman Namibia. Yes. yes. Okay. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> yes. It uh, it mandates uh, members or of, of the protocol or the the countries that have acceded to the protocol to um, create institutions that allow for protection of in traditional knowledge. Um, as a way, as a form of intellectual property. And because traditional knowledge, especially in the African continent, has been largely communal, in, as opposed to where I can say, this is my idea, it belongs to mm. me alone. Um, if, we have a, if we have a way of dealing with a plant to produce the medicine, it's something that is known by everyone and mm. it's specific to our community. Although we do have experts, we do have Dingaka. Who, of course. Yeah, for of instance, course. when it comes to Tobeha, <laughs> there must be a handful of guys who know about Tobeha. Yes, no, yeah. absolutely. So it so it's a, it's about taking those, making sure that the communities who own that information, who own mm. that information, are able to benefit from its use. Particularly considering that a lot of you know outside companies, a lot of outside uh, entities are coming now in to make use of um, whatever traditional knowledge is here. I think a couple of years ago there was uh, a scandal online when I believe it was Louis Vuitton. Mm. or a European fashion house mm. that took the, the Basuto blanket and mm. they made a whole fashion line out of it. Yeah. Um, and it was, a, it, was a, it was an issue to say, how, how do we protect the, this as a piece of African traditional yeah. cultural expression? And there was also a lot of talk about the, the Sangapa Rile, yeah, of, yeah. how Western companies are coming yeah. here, taking Germans, that. Germans, yeah. As, and I read somewhere that even the Kotla system, somebody has... <laughs> has injected themselves uh, as registered something to claim the quota uh, system, the system of dispute resolution. Absolutely, there's a there's a trademark registered in Denmark of all places called <laughs> called Le Kotla. Yeah. Uh, yes. So it, it's a, yeah. It, it, but that's an issue for another day. <laughs> I, I would want to hear from you how we should fight things like this. I, Is there anything we can do to get our 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 rights back? Um, I, I, that's something that I personally am currently looking into because. Um, the, I mean, when you register a trademark, it, it's a, it's a matter of, is it, is it non-descriptive of what, you know, what, because you can't trademark glass, let's mm, say, no, you can't, glass, you can't, no. do, you can't mm. say that, but, uh, but also it's, it's a matter of ethically, when you do something like that and you place power to use something like that outside of the context of the people who it belongs to, mm. what does that mean? So mm. that. I see, you know, there are a lot of people who are concerned about that, and I personally am one of them, mm. and that's something that I'm privately looking into, but I will <laughs> share more. Yeah, uh, it, but have yeah. you personally been able to register any cultural expression or, or you know, traditional knowledge, mm -hmm. or do you know someone who has successfully done it? Um, I don't know, I do not personally know of people who have successfully done it, mm. but I do know that, that there are people who have done that. Mm. Uh, I do, the challenge then is usually, um, it has to be, um, it has to be, because it's a communal thing, mm. the communities do not yet have enough information to say, this belongs to a community, so let's register it as a community. Mm. Usually what would happen would be me saying, no, I know how to do this and I know I want to own it for myself, but it's traditional knowledge. I, if it's something that belongs to a community, I can't take ownership yeah, of it no, for myself. Yeah. Yes. So I think more education along the way is needed. All right. Um, let's talk about the role of IP, intellectual property, in resolving, you know, global conflicts. Right. Um, what role does it play and mm -hmm. have you personally been a part of such efforts? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I am part of a network of in, uh, uh, intellectual property practitioners around the world. Mm -hmm. And um, what the network, largely what it does is to facilitate um, the trading of intellectual property assets and the protection of intellectual property assets between practitioners um, mm. in different parts of the world. So if there's somebody in the US who would like to seek protection for a certain thing in Botswana, they know that oh, there's 
people in Botswana that we can talk to who are mm. more familiar with the system. Same way, if the Botswana wants protection for something in Denmark, mm. uh, they know there's somebody, there's a network that we are part of that can facilitate that. Is, is it working? Has, are there any practical examples? Um, it, it, it is working because I think they are mo largely, uh, especially from Botswana, who seek uh, to have their ideas protected outside. Um, because I think a lot of a lot of Botswana now are looking to become competitors in a global market. Mm -hmm. They're looking. They're not just looking to have their products or their services limited, you know, to the two million people, mm -hmm. two million people in, in this country. They're mm -hmm. looking to expand more. And mm -hmm. the need when, when once they step outside the borders, they need to know that whatever they are trading in is protected. Mm -hmm. They need to know that they're not going to run into any IP conflicts down the line. They mm -hmm. need to know that they're not going to find themselves in a situation there where they're possibly infringing on somebody's mm -hmm. uh, on somebody's intellectual property rights. Which um, makes me wonder whether it's important to register in individual countries mm -hmm. or for as long as a country has acceded to a convention or right. something, there's automatic protection. It's, it's not necessarily automatic. Um, mm -hmm. But it's 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 a pro, it's made simple by the accession mm -hmm. in the sense that if I'm applying to register a patent, uh, I think in my declaration I have to specify the countries that I would like to register that patent mm -hmm. in, and because there is a cost for registering um, in those countries, there's I also need to be it also needs to be a business consideration of mm -hmm. where is this trademark going mm -hmm. to be used? Mm -hmm. Practically, where am I going to use it? Yes. If I'm going to register it in Namibia and have to maintain it. Um, as a, as a piece of IP in Namibia, when I don't have any business in Namibia, it's a cost to the business and it's not worth doing yeah. it that way. And when you say cost, the costs in this regard can be substantial. Are we talking, uh, it, are we talking five <laughs> figures, six <laughs> figures, seven <laughs> figures? Not, not, not necessarily. Yeah. Not necessarily. But again, these are matters that are very jurisdictional. Mm. Uh, it depends. I mean, in Botswana, I believe it's fairly, fairly cheap to, to maintain uh, a piece of IP. But, you know, in other jurisdictions, it's it takes some mm. investment to do that. Um, so if I'm going to, for example, you know, try to maintain a trademark in South Africa, mm. uh, in Botswana and South Africa, in Botswana it would be fairly easy to maintain it, but in the next country it may not be so. Yeah, a conversation safe. like this would not be complete without us talking about COVID-19. We're in the midst of it. Absolutely. In Botswana, thankfully, maybe things are c coming down a bit, mm. maybe South Africa, yeah. talking about loosening borders. Yeah. But certainly places like America, Right. You know, there's a spike and things like that. So let's talk about the COVID-19 economy mm -hmm. and IP and the role it plays. Can mm -hmm. you talk about the dynamic that is at play there? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that COVID-19 has done is to create a shift in what assets can do and what type of assets can do. I think for a lot of, you know, multinational corporations, over the the COVID nine over over the course of the pandemic, a lot of companies, not even multinationals, just companies generally, have found that their the more traditional assets, uh, you know, land capital and such, are very vulnerable to changes in the in the in the global economic, you know, startup. Mm -hmm. uh, so thing and then there are things like intellectual property, which tend to be more resistant to. Um, they tend to be more resistant to those fluctuations mm -hmm. and also they tend to they are growing now more in value than um, the more traditional assets i always mm -hmm. give an example of you know one of the biggest taxi companies uber mm -hmm. practically doesn't own any cars no right? it doesn't but but it's the ip behind it of saying we can monetize this by using other people on the app on the, on the app right yeah so ideas a lot ideas are becoming more valuable than tangible assets. And I think um, over time, we're, as we shift again towards an economy that is based on creation and provision of solutions, mm. um, th that that's an, I think COVID-19 accelerated that process mm. towards that shift. Uh, and so I believe that IP is going to play an even bigger role as, um, as we recover and move forward from the, from the pandemic. Okay. If you could cast your mind forward, you know, maybe the next five to ten years and talk to us about the challenges right. um, relating to IP development, mm. um, what would you what would you touch on? Um, you know, uh, the development of IP itself mm. can be a very expensive process. Mm. It can be a very resource intensive process. 
Um, so the challenge is, you know, in developing the IP itself, you would you know there's need to access like to things like funding. Um, but I, I think a lot of companies, a lot of banks, a lot of governments the world over are beginning to realize that and are beginning to allow the collateralization of IP. Uh, mm -hmm. So basically using your IP as security, I'm able to say, I'm going to produce this medicine, mm -hmm. uh, but I need money to do the research to produce it. Uh, so I, I mean, can, banks can bond IT. Right. You so can have a, register a, a, some kind of mortgage against. Absolutely. So against the future earnings of that particular. And is it something that your firm does also? Well, now because I, we are in a country that does not... Uh, that is that is only starting to do that. I think only a couple of weeks ago uh, there was an announcement about collateralization of IP. But it is something that we are. It's a capacity that we're looking towards, uh, you know, making ourselves competent in mm -hmm. and being able to provide that as a, as a solution. Mm -hmm. And I think also the other challenge with IP development is that uh, the practice of producing solutions, innovations, creations evolves faster than the legal frameworks mm. that govern it. Uh, so there's a, you know, there's new technology every day. There's new ways of doing business every day. It's about, you know, the legislators being on, being as apprised as they are, mm. uh, and just trying to be to stay as close to the actual economic reality as possible. Yeah. Um, just as we conclude our conversation there, you look to South Africa, you find large law firms like Spur and Fisher, which right. specialize in IP. Right. Uh, you find someone who's an engineer as a first degree and then will have an LLB as a second deg a degree. Right. And having those people uh, in large numbers um, and where there's a strong IP culture. Right. Do you see Botswana heading that direction? Is it getting to a point where we'll have IP professionals such as yourself yes. uh, proliferating the landscape and, and, and providing these services? I, I believe so. I believe so. I, I think um, I, I'm arguably, yeah. <laughs> arguably, I'm very grateful to be, um, you know, the, the first to do what I'm doing in the way that, I mean, there have been many practitioners in IP before, but mm. uh, to have been the first to set up something that is specifically dedicated for that. Mm. Uh, it's, it's, it was a good step. And mm. I think what I'm seeing a lot, for, I'm, even my seniors in the field are, you know, looking to engage in that work and looking mm. to maybe learn more about it and take interest in it. And the younger ones coming up as well are looking to, you know, they're starting to see it as a viable mm. way of practice. So I, I do think in the, it won't take long. And just the next couple of years, there will be, many of us around. Mr. Moremi, we, we've come to the end of our time together. Yeah. I'd like you to look at the camera yeah. and um, you know, give a parting shot to the viewer yeah. in terms of something motivational, inspirational, right. and even encourage them to subscribe to our, our podcast <laughs> as well, if you don't mind. No, absolutely, I did, I did. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I think for me, if the... Um, First of all, like and subscribe, please do. This is a very fantastic channel. Um, and secondly, I think that, you know, innovation is something that the world will never not need. For every day that, for every day that human beings are alive on this planet, there will always be a challenge and there will always be a need for somebody to provide a solution. And I think each one of us, we are solution providers in our own ways. Um, it doesn't have to be you figuring out what the next penicillin is. It's about you looking at your community and figuring out what change needs to happen in your community. And you can be a solution provider. And together, when we all provide solutions, we build a better continent for ourselves and, you, and for the next generation as well. Thank you. Um, do you mind also sharing your contact details? Absolutely not. Mm. Um, you can email me at moremi at parkgray.com. That's M-O-R-E-I-M-E -E at P-A-R-K-G-R-E-Y dot com. Or you can contact me on plus two six seven seven three four one zero zero three nine. Or follow us on social media at Park Gray IP on Twitter, on Instagram, or just Park Gray IP on Facebook. Okay, let me take this opportunity sir, to recognize you. 
and to acknowledge and applaud you for your efforts. Thank you. And this was a very good move. Um, You're an innovator Thank and you. a trailblazer in your own right. Thank you. And for sir. that, we fully appreciate you, sir. Thank you. I'm May very you humble. be blessed. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right.